Welcome back to KFU Radio. Across the fence is what you're listening to. And I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller of Aurora, Colorado. And your host every Monday afternoon on Cross Defense, where we consider the various things that are happening in the world in light of the God's Word and rejoice in the clarity of law and gospel, the wisdom of God and the Ten Commandments, the joy that the Lord gives us in the forgiveness of sins, and all of that. Uh, we've got a bunch more, by the way, theology. We're doing a bunch of video stuff and audio stuff that you can find on the website if you're interested in this sort of thing. It's wolfmuller.co, W O L F M U E L L E R. Uh, dot co today uh, we're gonna we got two things happening one is we're gonna talk about love uh, and that we're gonna talk about love for about 15 20 minutes until Stephanie starts playing the music to go to the first break and then uh, we're gonna get my good friend pastor Brian Kachmar he's gonna come on and who knows what he's gonna talk about I, I have no idea what he's gonna bring to us today uh, but I've got uh, but I I am just wondering because I've got enough to talk about with love if we might not just have him uh, th- to think about love with him as well because love is such a, a popular topic now I want to start off then with, with one two three four five six seven things to say about love but we should probably start with the scriptures uh, here's the story it's Holy Tuesday that means Tuesday before Good Friday Tuesday that uh, on the week that Jesus Uh, was going to be crucified. And it's the last time that Jesus was publicly teaching. He's in the temple, and they're coming, the scribes and the Pharisees are coming to him to to challenge him, to get after him, and to give some reason to accuse him and to be able to arrest him. And so they bring first a question about paying taxes. They thought, hey, if we can get Jesus saying you shouldn't pay taxes, that'll be great, because then Rome will want him just as bad as we do, and he'll get in trouble that way. But he takes the coin, he says, whose picture is it? And they say, Caesar's. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's, give to God what's God. So that didn't work. So then the Pharisees, then the Sadducees, who didn't even believe in the resurrection, and that was maybe part of the point, they came to Jesus and told the story about the woman who was married to seven men. None of them had, she didn't have children with any of them. They all die. Who, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And Jesus answers that. So then a lawyer comes with this great old rabbinic question. They've been Rabbis have been asking this question for years, and they hadn't been able to answer it. What's the greatest commandment? And uh, this, this is how the text goes. I'm reading from, uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 22. And a lawyer came and asked a question to test him. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And he, without even missing a beat, Jesus answers like that, whap. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So, so love, says Jesus, is the fulfilling of the law. If you want to take, remember there's two tablets of the law. When Moses came down from the mountain, Mount Sinai, he had two tablets uh, one with the commandments one to three on it, the, the love for, that we have for God, and the other, commandments four to ten, love your neighbor as yourself. These two tablets are summarized by Jesus that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we should love our neighbors ourselves. Paul even says in Romans, he says, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to the neighbor. So that love, if you want to, if you take, imagine it like this. If you, if you took the ten commandments from Moses and you put them in a dehydrator, now pretend like they're not written out of stone, but uh, you know, but you put the Ten Commandments in a dehydrator, uh, and you boil them down. They shrink down to two things, and you get this: love God and love your neighbor. Blam, two. And then let's say you leave them in there for two weeks. You know, my grandmother has a dehydrator, and she'd always put. You know, there's there's some things that go well in a dehydrator, like bananas. I mean, de- bananas don't start that good, but they seem to get better by being dehydrated. But there's some things that are just that go worse, like. Uh, Grapes. Should, I mean, that's like the wor- Raisins are the worst use of grapes that I could possibly imagine. I mean, unbelievable waste of grapes. But anyhow, anyhow, so you put, you leave it in there three weeks or something like this, and now it, um, uh, it starts to, uh, it starts to shrivel up. And if the Ten Commandments shrivel down to one word, you could have it there, and it would be love. So that love is a summary of God's law. But we want to be careful with that. Because love, it's, it's an amazing sort of thing how that, how that word love can be uh, misused. And so what we want to say, point two, is that while love is a summary of the law, love is not a replacement of the law. I can't say that just because I'm motivated by love that the thing that I'm doing is good or the thing that I'm doing is right. 
I uh, I can't um, I, I I can't say that because I'm motivated by love that the that uh, that whatever it is that I happen to accomplish motivated by that love is a go- is a good thing. I could be motivated by love and I could sin. Now, cl- clearly, this is the thing that we got to think about quite a bit in our own context because so much pe- people say, "Look, uh, if it's if it's motivated by love, it's good." Now, I just the most common time you hear stuff like this is, has to do with the sixth commandment. Uh, hey, you know, I think we're going to move in together. I know we're not married, and you're not supposed to move in together till you're married. But, but by the way, we love each other, so that makes it okay. You see how love is used as a replacement for the commandments. If I've got love, then I don't have to worry about anything else. No, that is not the case. You can't use love against the commandments. It is not love. It is a sin to set love against the commandments of God. So we have to understand, and this is going to be point three of our seven points. I wonder how we're doing on time. Pretty good, I think. Point three is that love is shaped by the Ten Commandments. Love is shaped by the Ten Commandments. There's a sixth commandment shaped love. There's a fifth commandment shaped love. There's a third commandment shaped love. There's a fourth commandment shaped love. There's a seventh commandment shaped love. So when I'm not stealing, I'm loving someone by not taking their stuff. That's, a, that's the shape that love takes according to the Seventh Commandment. And when I go to church on Sunday, I'm, I'm loving my... That's the shape that love takes when it's shaped by the Third Commandment. You see how that works? That love according to the Sixth Commandment, you shall not commit adultery, looks one particular way. And, and, it's a, it's a, and, and it also looks differently. The, the shape of love is different depending on our own vocation. So if I'm, if I'm married, my Sixth Commandment love looks very different than if I'm not married. Chastity looks different depending on my vocation. If I'm, say, let's say I'm a boss and I have employees, then my keeping of the Seventh Commandment looks quite a bit different than my employees' keeping of the Seventh Commandment. My, my keeping the Seventh Commandment looks like generosity and kindness towards the people that work for me, and their keeping of the Seventh Commandment looks like diligence and working hard. It, uh, the, the, the Fourth Commandment love, honor your father and your mother, looks different for a child than it does for a grown-up. It looks different if your parents are living or if your parents are are have gone to the face of Jesus are in heaven now it, it, you're, the fourth the shape of the fourth commandment love looks different now so so each so love is shaped by the commandments and shaped by our vocation remember remember how Luther tells us to do when he says what sins could we, should we confess and he says what is your station in life according to the Ten Commandments that's a magic question that's there's some secret sauce in that question because that question what uh, uh, what is my place in life? What is my station in life according to the Ten Commandments? That answers the question, what should I do today? What should I pray for? And what should I repent of? The three major questions that the Christian asks. What should I do today? What should I pray for? And uh, and what should I repent of? What's your station in life according to the Ten Commandments? So that love, not only is love not set against the commandments, but love is given shape according to the Ten Commandments. As a pastor, my love for the people at Hope Lutheran Church takes the shape of preaching on Sunday, and their love for me takes the place of listening. And that has to do with point number, I can't remember what point we're on, point number next, point number four, according to my cards here, is that not only is love shaped by our vocation and shaped by the Ten Commandments, but love is also shaped by the need of our neighbor. Love is not an abstract sort of thing. In fact, we think of love as a, what is an emotion, as a, as a feeling, but love is an act. When we re- Remember how we, when we used to read the King James Version? It didn't even say love, it said charity, and that's kind of nice because charity has the sense still of doing something. So, so love is a doing thing. It's a giving thing. It's a serving thing. It's a dying thing. Jesus says, no greater love has any man than this, than he laid down his life for his friends, so that love is always a dying thing. Husbands, uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might purify her, make her holy, blameless, without fault, and, and this sort of thing. Talking about the gift of baptism, the gift of death and resurrection of Jesus, and so forth. But this is so that, so that love takes shape according to the, to the need of the neighbor. When I see someone who's hungry, my love for them looks like giving them something to eat. Or James talks about this. If you see someone who's cold and who's naked, love takes the shape of clothing them. And because every single neighbor of ours is also a sinner, then our love for them takes the shape of prayer for them, of, 
of 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 blessing them with the Lord's word, of trying to be kind to them in, in every way that we possibly can, but especially most especially by 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 telling them about Jesus and the and the death of Jesus on the cross. So that not only is our love shaped by the Ten Commandments and shaped and shaped by our vocation, but love is shaped by the need of our neighbor. And here we get to a, a particularly interesting point, and that is that our love for God is connected to our love for our neighbor. There's often times that we want to be sort of super religious people, super hyper religious folk. And we want to say, look, the, the thing that matters most is our love, is our love for God. We want to focus on our love for God. We want to pay attention to our love for God. But but John is going to give us some some pretty good advice. So here's 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. John says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, this one is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So that our love for God and our love for our neighbor is connected to one another. You can't go and say, hey, I, I'm busy loving God, so I can't love my neighbor. <laughs> That's part of the Pharisee game. Remember last week we talked about the Pharisee game. If you missed it, you got to go back to the podcast and listen to how it went last week. We were talking about how to be a Pharisee. He gave very clear instructions. So all you guys are sitting right there saying, hey, I wonder how I could be a Pharisee. Well, you just have to listen to last week's podcast. I think that's what we talked about. Here's, how to, here's the rules for how to be a Pharisee. But one of the, that's one of the things the Pharisees did is they, they said, hey, I'm too busy loving God. I can't love my neighbor. Ah, my parents might be old and my parents might be dying, but I've got, I've got temple duties to do. I've got to go and give and my tithe, and I can't take care of my parents because I've got all this stuff to do in the temple. I'm too busy loving God to love my neighbor. Jesus says, no, no. In fact, I think some of the Good Samaritan parables, remember the parable where here's the man who's beaten, he's naked, he's dying in the, in the ditch, and the scribe and the priest and the Pharisee walk by on the other side, they go around, they're too, they're too busy heading up to Jerusalem, and that's an emphatic point of the text. They're going to Jerusalem, so they don't have time to go and help their neighbor who's in need. Now, this is, this is one of the ways that Jesus is getting after this. He says, oh, yeah, you're too busy loving God so that you don't love your neighbor? No, you show your love for God by, by loving your neighbor. Here, here it is again from John. He says, uh, I love God. whoever says, I love God and hates his brother is a liar because he who does not love his brother who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. If you want to love God, you love your neighbor. You don't, you don't have an option. It is, it is not like when Jesus says, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the most important commandment. And Jesus says, now, if you just want to do that one, that's fine. The second one is optional. No, the second one is like it. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and, this, and, and I, I, here's another myth about that text. I, I hear people say all the time, well, if it's true that you have to love your neighbor as yourself, then that means we first have to love, our, we have to learn how to love ourselves so that then you can go and love your neighbor. No. That's just, that's horsewash. Is that what the word is? Horsewash? If it's not the right word, then that's we'll make it up right now. That's horsewash. That's nonsense. You have to learn how to love your you love yourself. When your head itches, you scratch it. When you're thirsty, you get something to drink. When you're hungry, you get something to eat. When you're cold, you look for a blanket. You take care of yourself without even thinking about it. You have to learn how to love yourself. You know how to love your, this, and this is the point. You have to love your neighbor like yourself. That is without even thinking about it, without even wondering about it, without even, it's just the instinctive sort of thing. I'll tell you a story. I remember one time I was watching the Rockies, which all of you should do. I know you're all in St. Louis and you're all weeping and mourning. So now that you don't have a baseball that you should root for the Rockies, I commend them to you. Don't turn off the radio just because I said that. But I remember one time I was watching the Rockies, and my son Isaac said, uh, and, and I got up, and I, I was thirsty, and I got up, and I got something to drink, and I sat back down. And as soon as I sat down, my son Isaac said, Dad, I'm thirsty. And I said, oh, oh you got to wait for the commercial. Now, I, I didn't wait for the commercial to get myself something to drink. I just went and got it. But when, when I have to do it for my, here's bone of my bone, flesh of my, my own son. 
And I and st- I and and I th- uh, and I'm complaining about it. This is what when Jesus says you have to love your neighbors yourself. This is what he's talking about. You don't even think about taking care of yourself. And this is how it should be with your neighbor. You can't say, and so you don't put put the love for that you have uh, for God against the love that you have for neighbor. They go together. Now here we get to the important. Well, this has all been somewhat important, but uh, to the to to where the rubber starts to hit the road, and that is that the command to love shows us our sin. We're tempted to think that love is a nice word, you know, a kind of Valentine's Day word. Love is it's surrounded by hearts and and flowers. Love it's a it's a word that has this great serenity to it. But love really, if love is a summary of the law, then love is really going to get after us because the command to love is then going to show us our sin. I can go to bed tonight and have a couple things checked off the list. Host cross defense check. Make the YouTube video about the binding of the devil check. Take out the trash. I even did that this morning. Check. Love your neighbors yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, love demands everything we've got so that love, this high standard of love, is always going to be showing us our sin. Now, we've got two more things to say, two more things to say about love. But Stephanie's over there telling me that we're running out of time. So we're going to go to the break. We're going to see if Pastor Ketchelmeyer is hanging around. We'll finish the list of things to say about love, and then we'll see what he's up to. Uh, you're listening to Cross Defense. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Uh, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and also host of Cross Defense. We'll be right back. This is Pastor John Veeker, Senior Assistant to President Harrison here in St. Louis. Agnus Day Liturgical Arts continues the fine tradition of proclaiming the gospel through Christian art, through the production of altarpieces, paintings, and drawings. Agnus Day Liturgical Arts portrays the gospel in all its splendor. Their website is agnusdayarts.com. That's A-G-N-U-S-D-E-I arts.com. I'm World Lutheran News Digest host Kip Allen. Does freedom of speech end at the church's door? Yes, it does. A law known as the Johnson Amendment prohibits nonprofit groups like churches from speaking on certain political issues. I discussed the Johnson Amendment and its effects with Family Research Council Vice President of Governmental Affairs David Christensen on World Lutheran News Digest, heard Wednesday at 2.30 and Saturday at 9.30 on Worldwide KFUO. Hi, I'm Gary Duncan, the General Manager of Worldwide KFUO. We promote our various programs. We ask you to listen to your favorite show. We ask you to support our broadcast ministry, and we thank you for that support. But maybe we don't ask you to pray for us as much as we should. Please pray for the staff, management, radio hosts, and volunteers here at Worldwide KFUO. Pray that the message of salvation through Christ is heard clearly by listeners around the world. Pray that we continue to reach into those areas that are hostile to the Word of God. Pray that KFUO continues to reach those people desperately needing to hear the good news message. And pray that God continues to bless us financially through the gifts we need to continue our broadcast ministry. Thank you for listening, supporting, and praying for Worldwide KFUO. You truly are appreciated. We are the messenger of good news. AM 850 in St. Louis, worldwide at KFUO.org. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and I heard a bad rumor, a nasty rumor during the break that Pastor Brian Ketchemeyer is on the line. Pastor Ketchemeyer, how are you? Doing good. Hey, my first question for you is, how did you get the name, the nickname, Old Bry? Uh, because uh, with age comes wisdom. Oh, hey, I'm working on a list of things about love. Did you hear any of that uh, before you jumped on? Uh, some of it, yeah. Some I'm not done with my list yet, but I want to <laughs> okay. know. So, so we got to finish the list. I, I didn't hear the you. beginning of your list, so I, okay. I, I can't help you. Okay, so here, I'll tell you, I'll run it down. First, love is the summary of the law. Like Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. But point two, love is not a replacement of the law. 
you can't just say, hey, I love, therefore it's good. Hey, we love each other. We're going to move in together. No. You, love, that's point three. Love takes shape according to the Ten Commandments. So there's a sixth commandment love, which looks like chastity, and it looks different if you're married or you're not married. There's a fourth commandment love, which looks like respect to those in authority. A third commandment love, uh, delighting in God's word and so forth. Fourth, love is shaped also by the need of the neighbor. So we don't want to do like James says, say, hey, go be well and fed and everything else like this, but, uh, but we don't care about uh, your physical needs. We want to take care of those as well. Point next, I can't remember, is that the love of God is connected to the love of the neighbor. Like John says, remember, uh, you can't say, I love God, but I hate my neighbor. Then the next point is that the command to love shows our sins. We're never done loving. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we are failures in this way so that the law is going to always show us our need for Christ. But then we get to point, I, can't, I think point six or seven, and that is that we know that we're sinners because we actually try to love. <laughs> and here I think is I, I, I want to get after what I see as a mistake sometimes amongst maybe even amongst the Lutherans and that is that I know I'm a sinner by God's word which is true I mean, in fact original sin is such a deep and profound corruption that we only know it because the Bible tells us how bad we are but we also know that we're sinners because we try to actually not sin and fail and I think we sometimes miss that preaching, that we just want to know that we're sinners by abstraction rather than failure. So, so far, those are, the, those are my theses on love. Anything you want to uh, talk about there or highlight? Well, maybe another uh, point would be the different kinds of love from Greek, uh, that when we talk about God's love, it's this agape love, this self-sacrificial, uh, self-giving love, this unconditional love, which is different than other types of love. I mean, it's not erotic love. It's not just a friendly love. It's not like you love the things that like you. But it's this unconditional, self-sacrificing love that you're giving of yourself with no expectation of something in return. That's the kind of love that God has for us, and that's the kind of love that we are to love Him and to love one another. Yeah, that's nice. Now, that, that actually has to do with my last point, that, and that is that God is love. This is what John says. So do you, do you remember that? You and I had this conversation. I remember this very distinctly. I don't know if you remember because, you know, you're old brah. But uh, we, are, we are at the seminary, and we we're walking up the stairs, and we were talking about the distinction between law and gospel. And we said, and we were talking about, dis, we were talking about singular words, and we're saying, is that word law or is that word gospel? Remember that? To some and extent, we... yeah. Is that where you started breaking into uh, what's love got to do with it, the song? <laughs> That's probably. I was singing that all the time during seminary. Uh, or uh, the Beatles song, All You Need Is Love. Uh, my, that, by the way, my singing of the Beatles song right there was so accurate that I probably broke the copyright laws. I just wanted so the question of, we, we talked about, we said, what about the word wrath? Is wrath law or gospel? And we decided, hey, it depends on who's getting it. <laughs> is the wrath the wrath of God that's being poured out on Christ? Then that actually is the purest of gospel. If the wrath of God is coming out, being poured out on me, that's, that's in fact, our, our, that's hell. But the same thing is true for love. Love is the summary of the law, but if the love is God's love for us, <laughs> then it's the most beautiful gospel. So John says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as the propitiation for our sins. So that, so that even though the word love is a summary of the law, we also, love is, is, the, is one of the greatest words of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. Thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, definitely. That this, uh, the, the idea of wrath, though, um, one, one note about that, when, when you have the understanding of God's wrath being poured, about, uh, poured out upon Jesus, if you just have that information, that the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, I, I would say that that is not in and of itself the gospel, that that's just, uh, that's actually the law, uh, that, that it shows God's wrath because of sin. Uh, so just the language of God's wrath being poured out upon Jesus, it, it shows forth uh, that uh, sin is something that, uh, that we do, it separates us from God, and it brings his anger. And if you leave it at that, it's just, it's going to be all law. That the gospel then, of course, needs to be articulated so that you understand that he took the wrath for us. 
that that wrath was our because of our sin and it was placed upon him and now his righteousness becomes our righteousness by faith um so that that idea of wrath on christ uh, the understanding of, of the law the understanding of the gospel here uh that uh, that that wrath upon jesus i i don't think we it would be fair to say that that is in and of itself a display of god's love so wrath on jesus is wrath because of sin right that's true i that reminds me of this that fantastic passage from the lutheran confessions that says that the that the cross is the most severe preaching of the law Remember that's now that's an amazing thing to actually say, but I think that's exactly what you're getting at. If we yeah, just see, exactly. if we yeah, yeah, see yeah, the yeah. cross as the as the as the demonstration of God's wrath over sin, then that is not that's not yet the kindness of God for us sinners. Right, right. Ha! Ah, fantastic. All right. Any more thoughts on love? Uh, no. Okay. So what do you got? <laughs> Uh, fair enough, uh, but but all, all this language here is maybe something that that I've got uh, that that I, I've been kind of uh, thinking about. But this idea that you're saying here that the command to love, it's going to show us our sin. Uh, that that and then trying to do it is going to show us our sin. Um, a lot of this has to do with what I've been meditating upon lately. Is this understanding from the Lutheran confessions that the law always accuses? Ah, and, yeah, you've been writing about that too. I, in fact, we'll try to in the podcast notes we'll try to put some links to the articles because you've been putting some uh, some really helpful stuff together about that. Yeah, and, and I, I think the the latest thing that even goes beyond that, which I think is most beneficial, is understanding what it means to accuse is directly linked to understanding of satisfying the law. Uh, so when we talk about accusation in, in the Apology by Melanchthon and we confess this as Lutherans, we're not talking about accusation of making somebody feel guilty for a sin. Now let me be clear on that. Uh, what I mean by that is the accusation is not an accusing you for breaking one commandment. It's not telling you that you're guilty of one infraction of God's law. Instead, for Melanchthon, the accusation is that you have not satisfied the whole law. So you're not guilty of one thing, you're guilty of all things. And that's what the curse is, uh, the, the curse of the law itself. As cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So when we say the law always accuses, we don't mean that it, it's going to always tell you that you have failed in one thing. Instead, the accusation is that you have not completely fulfilled the law and satisfied it by your own works or effort. And so this is the real issue, is that the law itself is an image of God's holiness and his righteousness. It shows us who God is in his own being and essence. And when we are compared to God's holiness and righteousness, we are unholy and unrighteous. Uh, and so it, it's not like uh, you're accused of, of committing one sin, and therefore now you're guilty, and now you're condemned because you got a, a 99% on the test, and it's not good enough to be 100%. The curse of the law is that if you've broken one thing, you have failed on everything. So you get a 0%. It's not a 98 and it's just a one short. It's you get a zero. It, this is, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a gradation scale here. And so I, I think that this is helpful to understand this idea of the satisfaction of the law. And that also helps us to understand when we talk about how the law always accuses, there are plenty of people who are walking around and the law is not accusing them. It doesn't accuse them at all. They don't feel accused. Because I, I think that the common understanding of the accusation of the law is that it makes you feel guilty. And so you've got people who are living in unrepentant sin, and they say, hey, I don't feel guilty. And you say, well, why isn't the law accusing them if it always accuses? And, and in fact, this is exactly what you see in the Pharisee. The Pharisee thinks that he has satisfied the demands of the law. He thinks it. And because he thinks he's satisfied the demands of the law, then he doesn't feel the accusation and the condemnation of the law, because he thinks that he's doing everything right. And so what the Pharisee always does is he's putting other people under judgment because he's going to accuse other people of not satisfying the law like he's doing it. Oh man, that's a lot. Okay, so that's. Oh, I wanted to, you. I think you've opened two doors. Now you're tempting me. 
I'm standing in the hall, and I got to decide what door to go into now. <laughs> we go one or two door. Yeah. Okay. Let's do, so let's walk through door one first. So yeah. uh, so James says, this is James two ten. Whoever shall keep the whole law, yet stumble in one point, is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you don't commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. This is, this is the point one that you're saying, is that, look, the law is, um, it's not like it's graded on a curb. You break the law in one point, and you're guilty of the whole shebang. Now, now, how do you so so contrast to that to what you mostly so? Do you think that most people, when they think of being guilty of the law, that means they're well? I've I'm righteous according to this, 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 but I might be guilty according to this, 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 this. Like I've, I went to church, so I've I've got the third commandment okay, but maybe I liked I, I coveted my neighbor's house, so I'm in trouble according to. The, so and, and we sort of parse it out like that. Is that how you think most people are are wrestling with this? I think what we have is Philip Melanchthon, when he writes his commentary on the Book of Romans, I mean, he helps out just wonderfully here in this whole understanding of what it means that the law always accuses and what it means that we fail to satisfy the law. And in particular, when Melanchthon's talking about Romans chapter 7, verse 8, where Paul makes this comment saying, without the law, sin lies dead. And so now Melanchthon's going to try to explain what does this mean that without the law, sin lies dead. And because you've had in the history of the church, some people will say, well, uh, Paul is not talking about himself because he's a saint, right? And so Paul's just hypothetically, in an abstract way, talking about somebody else who wrestles with these issues. Well, Melanchthon says hogwash. That's not it at all. Instead, he says that there's three different categories we want to understand when this, with the law and how it always accuses. And so in category number one, this is the carnally secure Okay. Category number two is the oppressed conscience. And then category number three is the justified. Now, let me explain category number one. Is it okay, so hold on. So yeah. I'm, I'm writing this. I'm yeah. taking notes. I yeah. think you'd like to know that I'm taking notes. I'm not sure I've ever actually taken notes from anything that you've said, old brat. I mean, Pastor Ketchermeyer. But I am writing this down because this seems like it's going to be helpful. Okay, so number one is the carnally secure. That would be like the Pharisee that you're talking about. And um, the Epicurean. Okay, ah. so you want both of these in that category. Okay. Because and then number have, two is the oppressed conscience. And the oppressed about. conscience. And so okay. Melanchthon gives the example of Saul, King Saul, and Judas Iscariot. Ah, okay. So, so okay, carnally secure, that's pride. The oppressed conscience, that's despair. And then the third one is the Christian. Yes, the justified. The justified, okay. Yeah. Okay. But we so, want to go with that, that carnally secure, because it's not just pride. It's the Pharisaic pride on one hand, but on the other hand, it's the Epicurean indifference. Okay, so both of these individuals are carnally secure. The pride issue that you're talking about, these, this is the Pharisaic mind. And the Pharisaic hey, I got a question, mind. by the way. Yeah. So, so on the Epicurean thing, and, you know, just asking for a friend, because I know all about the Epicurean. <laughs> so give the lowdown for what Epicurean means again. You know, well, asking for a friend. Yeah. Well, just think of the idea of eat, drink, and be merry. It's an ah, indifference yeah. okay. to everything. That, that God is not going to act. God doesn't really care if God acts. He's not going to do anything. And so basically with the Epicurean indifference, there is no need to satisfy the law. You just freely do whatever you want. I mean, there's no need. You don't have to satisfy the law. You can try if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. I mean, you just live your life uh, free-spirited, do whatever you want. So this Epicurean indifference is that there's no need to satisfy the law, whereas on the flip side, the Pharisee and their pride, they think that they've satisfied the law. I mean, you get so this is, they're both yep, carnally yep. secure. So yep, on one yep. end, carnally secure, you say, I've done everything that I've needed to do, but it's all those other sinners out there who haven't done things like me. That's the Pharisee. Right. Yep, but the Epicurean says, I don't need to satisfy the law. I'm a law unto myself. I do whatever I want, and there's no God who really cares. If there is a God, who knows? If, he, if he's there, he doesn't act. It doesn't matter. It's, they're indifferent. Gotcha. Okay, and then point two is the oppressed conscience. We've got about two minutes to the break, so let's, uh, let's run down what the oppressed conscience looks like. So the oppressed conscience is somebody who actually then feels the accusation of the law. Now, what's the accusation of the law? You're being accused because you have not satisfied the law. 
Remember, Carnally Secure think they either they have or it doesn't need to be done. The oppressed conscience realizes that it needs to be satisfied and that the oppressed conscience knows it hasn't. So this is somebody like King Saul who falls into this oppression, or Judas Iscariot who realizes that they have not satisfied the law, and now the magnitude of their sin is being brought before their eyes, and the wrath of God because of their sin is brought into their heart. And so they are in this oppressed state of fear. And so they're paralyzed. They, they don't know what to do. So that third category is the justified, who, yes, they feel the accusation of the law, but the voice of the gospel brings them comfort. They trust that Christ alone has satisfied the law for them. And so they're raised up in the midst of the terrors of the conscience, and this struggle continues throughout their lives. Yet faith fights against the fears of this conscience as being terrified by this, this voice of accusation, so that the Christian can say to his own conscience, Conscience, I know I haven't satisfied the law, but Christ satisfied it for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Three ways that the law accuses. We're listening to Pastor Brian Ketchemeyer talk about it. I mean, we're listening to old Bri talk about this here on Cross Defense on Monday afternoon. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. we got a break coming up. We're going to do that now and then come back and talk more about the laws, the accusations of the laws, the different shapes of the accusation of the law, and how the accusation of the law, how that voice and preaching of the law comes to an end in the death of Jesus for the Christian. So that, so that for the Christian, there is no accusation. There is no condemnation anymore because Christ has suffered it already. You're listening to Cross Defense. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is the day which the Lord has made. For the lonely and homebound, for the grieving and dying, and for all those who are afflicted in body, mind, and spirit, especially for me. Join us for a live broadcast of Chapel at the LCMS International Center weekdays at 10 a.m. on KFUO. Hi, this is Pastor Mark Azil, the LCMS Director of Campus Ministry and the Chancellor of LCMSU, inviting you to join us right here on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in the Student Union. If you can't make it, Student Union is always available as a podcast at kfuo.org. Learn more about LCMSU at lcmsu.org. And remember, college is tough. You need Jesus. We'll help. Wednesday afternoon at 2 on KFUO. Last year, a record-breaking number of people visited Israel, more than 3 million, 800,000 of which were Americans, a number that keeps increasing. But did you know, through a 360-degree virtual reality tour, anyone can experience Nazareth, sail the Sea of Galilee, walk the path of the Good Samaritan, climb the stairs to the Temple Mount, or walk the mountains and valleys of the lands of the Bible. It's so real. Quite an experience. I never thought I'd get to see places like that. Absolutely beautiful. It's like I'm really there. It's all part of Museum of the Bible's virtual reality tour of more than two dozen famous biblical sites so that anyone may engage with the stories and influence of the Bible in the very land in which its stories took place. Engage with the Bible and its influence over the centuries. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Back to I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. I don't know why I have to say that so many times, but it seems to be the radio style. I guess people are tuning in and out, so if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Cross the Fence, and I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, uh, and uh, I'm just assuming that no one would have tuned out because I've got as my guest, Pastor Brian Ketchermeyer, talking about the law and how the law accuses differently in different ways for different people. Uh, he's talking about Romans. In fact, he brought out Melanchthon's commentary on Romans chapter 7, verse 8, which says, Sin taking the opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desires for apart from the law sin was dead and Melanchthon uh, explaining what that means says that look there's there's basically three kinds of people 
and the law, the way that the law, it see, Pastor Ketchmar, see if I'm getting this right. The, the way that the law uh, accuses these three different categories of people is different. You have the the carnally secure, either the Pharisee who thinks that he's not condemned by the law because he's kept it all, or the Epicurean who doesn't care about the law. That's the carnally secure. And then you have the oppressed conscience, the despairing, like Judas and King Saul, who 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 know that they've sinned but have no idea where to turn for help. And then you have the Christian who who knows the law will show the Christian their sin, but the Christian knows that Christ has suffered the wrath of God in our place for us, so that now the law cannot uh, condemn us. The law cannot even it doesn't even accuse us. It doesn't. The, the law cannot judge us because it doesn't have that vocation, that Christ is the judge and he's determined that we are righteous, we are justified. And so so Jesus is the one who has the last word. Am I, am I getting it? Well, again, just to clarify, it, it's not just an accusation of one sin, one infraction of the law. It's the full weight of the law comes upon you because of the curse. Cursed is everyone who does not complete everything written in the law. So when that conscience becomes oppressed, all of a sudden now the whole weight of the law falls upon the person. The magnitude of sin is magnified. This is the idea of sin becoming sinful beyond measure. And then you understand the wrath of God because of your sin. And so when uh, Melanchthon is talking about Paul, Paul was in category number one as carnally secure a Pharisee. He thought he satisfied the law. So the law wasn't accusing him. It wasn't condemning him. He felt no accusation at all because he made everything right. He satisfied everything demanded by God. But it was always all those sinners out there who don't do what God demands. Those are the ones that Paul is actually ending up accusing. So what happens different with Paul is Paul says, or, uh, or I should say Paul says, but also Melanchthon says, they both say that it's the gospel. It's the gospel that changed Paul's understanding of the law. So when, when Paul is saying that sin is lying dead without the law, Paul is saying that he, as a Pharisee, carnally secure, was living without the law. I mean, that's the theological significance here. So, of course, as a Pharisee, he's trying to abide by the law, and in fact, he thinks he's abided perfectly by the law, but Paul is actually calling that living without the law. Why? Because the law was not actually showing forth the full magnitude of the sin. And so when Paul sees the gospel, then all of a sudden he sees the magnitude of sin, which goes back to our conversation, how it began, with Christ dying on the tree, that Christ is the one who feels the full weight of God's wrath placed upon him because of sin. And so this is what awakens up for Paul this whole understanding of the magnitude of sin and God's wrath. But then as you continue to hear the gospel in its fullness, that the gospel is that Jesus took our sin and died for us. God's wrath was poured on him. Even though he was innocent, he satisfied the law for us, and then he imputes his righteousness to us by faith, so that now that law cannot accuse us is not completely satisfying the law because we have somebody who did it for us. The law cannot condemn us for not satisfying the law because we have somebody who has satisfied it for us. Christ is a mediator, and that's the whole point of needing a mediator. And, and that's why this Paul will say, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, to show, to show that Jesus is cursed for the whole law. I mean, the whole weight of the burden of the law for, for, for all of humanity is placed on Christ to the, so that he takes the full curse the full weight born of a one born under the law paul says in galatians to redeem those who were under the law so that we so we go from being so that christ puts himself under the law so that we would no longer be under the law this is the language of of paul in in galatians and to be under the law is to be under this curse to be under condemnation to, uh, to talk about this, because um, it's great to actually have it kind of fleshed out, and Melanchthon will do this in the Book of Concord. When he talks about Saul and Judas as examples of despair, he contrasts them with David and Peter. And the, and the way that he does it there is he says there's two parts of repentance. There's contrition, that is to, to know our own sinfulness, and then there's faith. So just to, I, I, by the way... 
You, I, I, I know that you're probably taking notes of all the things that I'm saying now, or Pastor Kachemar. Uh, you should write. You should jot this down. Uh, that when I die, I want it to be on my tombstone. Here is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, who always said that repentance has two parts. <laughs> Contrition and faith. I mean, I, I think that's so important. I mean, that that truth is so fantastically important. Repentance is contrition, sorrow over sin, and faith. Repentance is what happens when the law comes to us and shows us our sin, and then the gospel comes to us and gives us the promises of Christ. So, so repentance is, con- is contrition and faith. And Melanchthon will say that Saul and Judas had contrition without faith. They had that sorrow over sin, but they had no... They had no gospel, no comfort, no promise, whereas David and Peter had contrition mixed with faith. They knew their sin, but they also knew the power of Christ and the mercy of the forgiveness of sins. They had God's promises at the same time. So those two are contrasted to each other. You want to dig into any either one of those pairs there? No, I, I think that that's great, because this shows what Melanchthon is talking about, that category number two of a Judas and Saul, they are stuck there. So they, they stay there. They know this accusation of the law. They have not satisfied it. A magnitude uh, of their sin is now magnified in their own heart, in their own conscience. The terror of God's wrath is all upon them. They have no way out, and they're just paralyzed. They're stuck there. Whereas you have David and you have Peter who continue to hear the Word of God and the promises that are all fulfilled in Jesus. So they're the ones who continue to then focus on Jesus as the mediator, the one who is there for us right now, the one who is praying for us and interceding for us right now, the one who continues to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us so that we would be strengthened in faith, that we would have these new impulses, that we would begin to walk in the law. I mean, we're not under the law, which is under the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law because Christ has become a curse for us. And we've been freed from the condemnation of the law because Christ was condemned for us. So that you have Saul and David, that kind of that contrast there, Saul stuck in this oppression, David hearing the gospel, but yet he's still going to have these issues of conscience, uh, and he's going to be able to tell his own conscience, listen to the voice of Jesus. Same thing with Peter and Judas. Judas is stuck, and he's paralyzed, and he's oppressed by it, and he runs into utter despair. And so this is going to be the the issue here is is going to be despair, and the what you fight with despair is hope, or the, the lack of a faith, which is doubt, you fight with faith. So when you're stuck and you're oppressed, you're doubting and you're falling into despair. But when you continue to hear the good news, this good word that for the sake of Jesus, God is happy with you for his sake, because he satisfied it, you have this faith and hope which fights against the despair and the doubt. C.F.W. Walther, the, you know, the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, I, and I think he also started KFUO Radio. I don't know exactly the history. <laughs> I, I'm a little fuzzy on that history there, etc., but I know the radio station's pretty old. But he, do, he, has the, he does, does these lectures, right, the proper distinction between law and gospel. And one of the things that he says in there was um, that the law is for the carnally secure and the gospel is for those who have an oppressed conscience is that is he picking up on those same categories from Melanchthon there and saying now here's when you need to give the law and when you need to give the gospel well I, I think what CFW Walter is picking up on is the the way that Jesus will interact with the Pharisees again the Pharisees think that they have satisfied the law and so that's when Jesus will take the law and he will uh, for lack of a better word spiritualize it because it's not just the outward acts that make satisfaction for the law. The law demands outward and inward perfect obedience. And so this is where uh, uh, Walther will take up on, on Jesus when he says, you've heard it said that if you commit adultery, uh, this is sin. Yes, good. But I'm going to magnify, I'm going to spiritualize the, the law for you so that you understand as a Pharisee, you have not satisfied the perfect demands of the law in the heart. And so he goes to the heart and says, if you've lusted after a woman in the heart, you've already committed adultery. Or he does the same thing with murder. It's not just the outward act of murder. And you can say, hey, look, I'm a civil civil 
civilly righteous, uh, righteous by my own efforts, because I haven't murdered anybody today, well, Jesus can say he's going to spiritualize it. He's going to give it the, the weight that it needs in the heart and say, but if you've hated your brother in your heart, you've already murdered him. So this is where Walter, I, I think, is really going towards Jesus uh, interacting with the Pharisees. Yeah, and, and what is Jesus doing there? I mean, to, so to, to pick up this language of the different kinds of accusations, Jesus is seeing that here are, the, here are the Pharisees who are puffed up in pride. They think that they've kept the law so that they need to be crushed like a hammer. Uh, they, see, Jesus is going to use God's law like a hammer to crush their hardened heart. Is that, is that what's happening? Yes. Yes. No. Now, but, and that it would be in contrast to those who come to Jesus despairing over their sins, right? Right. So somebody who's oppressed. So you have an individual in that category, too, who's oppressed in the conscience, like a Saul or a Judas, but they come to Jesus, or I should say Jesus comes to them. Jesus comes to them with a good word, and they hear it, and they rejoice in this word of Jesus. You you didn't have uh, both Saul and Judas end up fleeing from God, because this is what happens when your your conscience is oppressed, is you're trying to figure out anything you can do to stop this voice of accusation. You're trying to silence your own conscience. And so you're, you're trying to do anything. You're reaching for straws. You're making stuff up as you go, but none of it's ever working. And so ultimately, the, the worst case scenario is you end up in suicide. Uh, you just you put yourself to death because you're going to silence the voice of the conscience. But those, those despairing individuals that Jesus is interacting with, these are the ones who already are crushed and oppressed by it, and Jesus gives them that wonderful word of comfort and that wonderful word that lifts them up to assure them that he forgives, that he is going to take the law himself, and he is going to perfectly satisfy it for that individual. He's going to then uh, remove all of their sin, not count it against them, and he's going to give them his righteousness, his holiness, that the law, of course, is an image of. Jesus tells a parable of the ta- the Pharisee and the tax collector. So both these guys, remember, go into the temple to pray. The Pharisee says, oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm awesome. Not like that tax collector over there. And he's up there, up front, whereas the tax collector's in back, beating his breast, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that's the one that goes home justified, the one who knows his own sin, who despairs over his sin. This is So So here's a, 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 a exactly and... An, uh, the same point that you're making, I think, is that Jesus is going to say, hey, look, how you consider your sin makes all the difference, that you have to know that you're a sinner, and it's precisely in recognizing our sin that we recognize that we need a Savior, we recognize our sin so that we know that we need the uh, God's work of justification, the kindness of Jesus to forgive our sins, and so forth and so on, right? Right, right, exactly. All right, now, look, we're going to run out of time. Stephanie, she, she had to put a bad word on the board here. She said three minutes. So, Pastor Ketchermeyer, we gotta we gotta run sprint to the end. What what do we need to make sure that we say? How does this make a difference in our own thinking about Christ? Well, okay, just to go back to Pharisee and tax collector again. The the issue is what Luke is telling us is that there were those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. I mean, that, that's basically what the Pharisee is doing. And so what we need to do as justified Christians by faith is those who hear the Word of God, we need to continue to hear the Word of God. We need to continue to uh, listen to God's voice, grow in the knowledge of salvation, because it's through that Word of both law and gospel that the Holy Spirit is at work. We don't want to put up obstacles in the way of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to reject the Word of God. We don't want to resist the Word of God. Instead, we want to continue to rejoice in the Word of God, continue to hear the Word of God, continue to learn. So that would mean, of course, uh, individually, you can read the Scripture yourself. You can listen to podcasts about uh, God's Word that's all centered in Jesus, uh, attend weekly service, or even go more than once a week, go to Bible class. And so it's always continuing to hear that Word of God, that the Holy Spirit would continue to work, and then praying that God would continue to open your eyes to see, your ears to hear, and your heart to believe. Pastor Brian Katchemeyer, pastor of Redeemer Lutheran Church in Los Alamos, New Mexico, host of the Redeemer Theological Academy, ah, author of the new book, Reading Isaiah with Luther, available from CPH, which is awesome. Uh, potentially. I've got a copy. I bet it is. When I, 
and uh, host of the Redeemer Theological Academy. Did I say that? You can find him, uh, email or Google Ketchelmeyer. His, his stuff will come up. Really fantastic, Pastor Ketchelmeyer. Thanks for being on the show. The law always accuses apart from Christ. But in Christ we have the freedom of the forgiveness of sins, the freedom even to live and to die without fear because all, all of our sin has been suffered and died for by Jesus already. So there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We fail to love, but Jesus has not failed to love. His love for us is perfect and complete, so perfect and complete that it forgives our sins, so perfect and complete that it makes us righteous, as righteous as he is, and able to stand before him in judgment, so perfect and complete that even if we die, we will live forever with him in the resurrection and eternal life where there is no sin, where, where righteousness dwells. This is the good news of law and gospel, the good news of the scripture, and the good news that we get from, well, from hearing the scriptures. I'm your host, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Join you next week off for Cross Defense. Listening to Cross Defense, produced by Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Your support is vital for this program to continue. To learn about giving opportunities, call Mary at 314 996 1518, or you can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at KFUO.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Cross Defense on Worldwide KFUO.